So my friend thinks he's smart. He told me an onion is the only food that make you cry. So I threw a coconut in his face. <laughs> then he was crying. The math teacher said to the student, I have five bottles in one hand and six in the other hand. What do I have? And the student said, a drinking problem. <laughs> I'm going to stop putting things off, said the procrastinator, starting tomorrow. That's one of my vices, procrastination. <laughs> I was head president of, uh, I was secretary of the Procrastination Society and they, they fired me for getting the reports in on time. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse four and five, for we know brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to bring these morsels to the family in the house today. And we pray for the power of the word to sink into each person today in Jesus' name. Amen. So he says, the gospel came to you. You can all probably tell me, because I know you're all born again believers, how it was that the gospel came to you. You may have been a child in Sunday school. You may have been an adult in church. Sometimes the gospel comes just because you pick up and read something on a Bible or a devotional, or a friend shares it with you. You can sit in a gathering of thousands you can sit in a large church. You can sit in a, on an auditorium and listen to a famous evangelist or listen to him on a television. You can sit in a small church and listen to a local pastor like we have here. You can be on a park bench and a believer approaches you. You can be over at the neighbor's house and the conversation comes around to eternity. You can be in a hospital bed with a couple of days left on this planet. Somehow God got to you. No matter where you were or who was, who was talking to you, the gospel, the good news, the message of forgiveness of God came to you and you found out about how a Savior came from glory and suffered and died to pay the penalty for your sins. The gospel came to you with words. You may have heard them. You may have read them. But the good news of God's love for you comes to you with words. Someone spoke it. Someone wrote it, you heard it, or you read it, and you believed it. You accepted it. You made it part of your life. Because of the word, your life is changed. Because of the word, you're on your way to heaven. Most awesome miracle that can ever be. Yes. Most awesome healing is the healing from the sickness of sin. Because eternity hangs in the balance. The gospel came with words, but not only with words. If the good news came only with words or with words that are not empowered, the words would be ineffective to you. Sometimes we can be in a conversation with someone and they're speaking words that are just rolling off of us. Ever been there? Be honest. <laughs> they're just rolling off. The words are not penetrating. The communication is ineffective. I can remember being in a horticulture class at Penn State. It was a pretty cool class. It was a it was a greenhouse course. But during the 
there was a, there was a, a class in, in, a, in a lecture, and then there were the greenhouse labs where you go in and actually do it, you know. But the professor, he was from Hawaii. His name was Hayakawa, Dr. Hayakawa from Hawaii. But he was a monotone speaker, monotone. And those words just, it put me to sleep. And it was an early morning class anyway. But I can remember being in class and not understanding what was spoken. The words were only vibrations in the air. The words were ineffective in my education. The good news was that most of what he was teaching was already in a botany class that I had that I, at Penn State that I had studied before that. So I knew the mechanics of what the plants are doing. I knew all that. And that's what he was teaching. So I already had that. But the greenhouse courses were great. We learned how to, how to uh, do stem cuttings and leaf cuttings and different kinds of seed startings. And we learned how to graft roses and fruit trees and stuff. It was pretty cool. But my dad's favorite way of discipline was giving me a big long lecture in one ear, out the other ear. After a few minutes, I wasn't even listening anymore. I was just standing there. His instructions came to my ear without power. They didn't change my behavior. Those words didn't penetrate. The words produced no change. I only became more determined not to get caught. <laughs> I was pretty good at that. Words that are only words are ineffective. Words that are effective come with power. That could be an emotional power. You say, I love you. Those words come with power. It comes with some emotion. And those words will penetrate. Number three, the gospel came with power. In the case that Paul, this letter was from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. In the case that he was referring to, there was power on the words. The words were powerful and effective. We know how powerful the word was from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. It says, and you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The words Paul was talking about in this scripture came with power. There was something different about this word. This word has a power on it. This word, the gospel, comes with power because it is God's word. The good news is God's word. The gospel is the good news. The gospel is God's story. The gospel is inspired by God, and his word always comes with power. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. The gospel is the power of God to bring salvation. The very words that bring the gospel come with the power of God, the power of, of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is. The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Isaiah 55, 11, 
So is my word that goes out from my mouth. I, it will not return to me empty, void in the King James, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's God's intention that goes with the power of his word. The gospel came with the Holy Spirit. The gospel, the good news of salvation, the word of God also came with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 6, 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Jesus said the words are full of the spirit and life. When God's word comes, it comes with the spirit. It is God's word in the first place. God's word. In the person of the Holy Spirit. Accompanies every morsel of the word. Into the heart of those who will receive it. Unfortunately, not everyone hears. That is to say, not everyone listens to the word. Not everyone has an open heart for the word. Not everyone can say with Jeremiah in Jeremiah 15, 16, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Isn't that powerful? He ate the words. In other words, he consumed them into his spirit. There are those who refuse the word. When you refuse the word, you reject the one who spoke the word. And you reject the one who is the word. John chapter 1 starts this way. In the beginning was the word, referring to Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. And without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the word. The word is all about him. No one can be saved without the word. There's no other way. No one can be set free from the law of sin and death without Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No one can be set free without the Word. And the Holy Spirit empowers the Word and brings it into the spirit of the sinner with conviction. The fifth point is the gospel comes with deep conviction. The deep conviction that brings people out of the darkness that the enemy of God wants to keep us in. The enemy wants us to be without light. Without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the word cannot penetrate the unrepentant heart. The unrepentant mind is not able to break through the veiled heart. The Holy Spirit pulls the veil down. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to, uh, 14 to 18. But their minds were made dull. For to this day some, the same veil, remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The Holy Spirit tears it down, burns it down. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Only in Christ is the veil taken away. The veil obscures 
the message. Unbelievers cannot penetrate the veil that obscures the gospel. They cannot see the light. They cannot. When they turn to Christ, that veil is taken away. You can see it happen. You can see it on their faces when they turn. It's just an amazing thing. Just amazing. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is essential in the effectiveness of the word. When we speak the word, our partner, the Holy Spirit, is at work in the person's spirit, pulling down the veil, bringing conviction, deep conviction. There's also a thief among us. We have a very real enemy. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus comes to bring light. Jesus is the light. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. I've already read this, but I'm going to read it again. Without him nothing was made that's been made. Jesus is the creator. He made all things. In him was the life, verse 4. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It sure tried, and it still tries. Darkness cannot overcome light. Darkness can't penetrate light. It's impossible. It's impossible, physically impossible for darkness. You can light a candle in a dark room, and light penetrates the darkness so you can see. But you can't light a dark. You can't start a dark in a light room. It doesn't, it, it's impossible. It can't overcome the light. The only darkness can exist where there is an interference with the light, a shadow of interference between the light and like the earth at night, the earth is in its own shadow. The light, the sun is still there. The earth is interfering with its light. So the, the devil never tries to stop, never stops trying to interfere. When something blocks light, a shadow falls and something interferes with the light. But the light is still there. The sun is still there. Matthew 13, 18 and 19. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away that, um, that was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. There's a thief among us. Snatching away what is sown. If you ever wondered why when you witness to somebody, they turn their back on you? Because the veil is still there. The enemy puts a veil over the heart of unbelievers. The enemy tries to obscure the word from reaching the heart of the unrepentant sinner. The enemy tries to keep a shadow over the word so it won't reach but it says when everyone's on, every, whenever someone turns to Christ, the veil is taken away. And there's nothing the enemy can do about that. Then the enemy steals the word, at least tries to steal it from any place where it can bring light into the darkness that he tries to keep the world in. 
So we have an enemy, 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind your enemy, the devil prowls, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We do have an enemy and we do struggle, Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The devil, Satan, hates you. When you get saved, you spit in his face, and he thought he had you. When you get saved, you give the devil a black eye because you're going to go tell somebody else. And he loses people that he thought he had. And he did. But the power of the word came to destroy his work. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, the truth of God came to you not only with words, the word came to you with power. The power came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought deep conviction. The Holy Spirit pulled down the veil from your heart. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, may this light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. You repented and received Christ as Lord and Savior. You were set free from the law of sin and death. Now you are the victory of Christ. Now you are the enemy of all the dirty demons. You have the light of God's glory. The enemy wants to destroy you. <laughs> he tries. That's why we have to be together as a church. You can't, you can't just be out there on your own as a Christian. That's why we get together. That's why we have a church. The enemy wants to destroy you. Wants to regain control over you. Eventually wants you to be in the same fate as him. He hates you. You ruined his attempt to keep you in darkness. When you share the gospel, you are ruining his dirty work. So he hates you. He assigns demons to destroy you, to get you back into the shadows, to get you back in to sin. But we have the victory. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Are you a conqueror? Are you? <laughs> Sometimes we don't act like it. You're talking about the power of the word and the anointing power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been called in to visit people in the hospital that were on borrowed time, last moments, last days. One lady, her son called me, come see my mom. She wasn't saved. And uh, he said, she can only hear with her right ear. You got to go down and talk real close to into her right ear. So I shared the gospel with her. And she couldn't respond verbally, but I had a hold of her hand. I said, if you agree with what I'm saying, squeeze my hand. And every point of the sinner's prayer, she squeezed. Then I preached her funeral just a few days after that. Graveside service. 
I went into another. This was a younger man and his girlfriend. And somebody asked me to go in the hospital and visit him. And I don't really do ambushes. I want to know that I'm welcome to go in there before I do that, you know. But this was an ambush, I think. <laughs> but I said to him, I said, you might not survive this. Because he, he had had a serious heart attack. And, and uh, I said, I came here to get you ready to meet God. And they both received Christ as Savior. Both of them did. The girlfriend and him. She did with tears, you know. But you can tell by the look on somebody's face that veil is coming down. The Holy Spirit is accompanying the word as you share it. And that's a ripening for salvation. It's just amazing. It's just a thrilling thing. And don't let me have all the fun. <laughs> you do it. <laughs> you do it too. There was another one. I didn't know him. Somebody else asked me to go see him. He was in Altoona Hospital. I said the same thing. I said, you, it looks like you're probably not going to survive this. He was in kidney failure. And he was able to respond, you know. He started confessing. <laughs> Shared the gospel with him. You can see that bill. You can tell by the look on their face that bill is coming down. You can tell. And he got saved. I've only have, ever had a couple people that said, I don't need this. That rejected the gospel. Only ever had a couple. And usually when they're on you know, on death's door. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I went over to see a lady, a, a lady's um, husband. She asked me to go see him. I knew, I knew this man already. But he was, he had had some kind of a, I don't know what, but he was paralyzed and, and he couldn't respond. And I think it was in Bedford, in the hospital. Either at Bedford or Huntington. And he always rejected even the thoughts of going to church or salvation. Always rejected that. He had been a... He was shot and stabbed both at different times. He had been a rough and tumble character. But he was a neighbor of my son. And he was a sweet person to them. But he had, had a past, you know. Anyway, she said, I need, I need you to go see him, you know. She was born again, but he wasn't. And all he could do, I wanted him to blink his eyes if he could understand and agree what I was saying to him. And all he could do was squint down about half. But he did. I said, if you understand, and blink your eyes, and he would squeeze down about half. And every point of the sinner's prayer I said, if you understand, you're agreeing, and you're going to do this, you know. And I went out and told his wife that he was born again, and he was going to go to heaven. I preached his funeral a few days after that. It's awesome when you can lead someone to the Lord, and then preach a funeral and give them a send-off. It's just, that's an amazing thing. And one of the uh, Teresa's ex-husband <clears throat> they asked me to go see him and he was uh, he was on death's door and uh, I think I asked him to nod and I couldn't tell about the response at all with him but <clears throat> what's her name was there she's the one who asked me what's her name I, I did their wedding um, what's her name hmm Ashley, she was there. And she wasn't related to him. And she said, I'm not leaving. She was going to stay there until the end. And she wasn't even related to him. But I was so impressed that she said, I'm not leaving. But she was the only one. She was taking care of him. And she could understand his responses. And I could not. But she was right there. And, and I said, well, as I left, I said, and I led him in the sinner's prayer. And I said to her, are you convinced that he responded in a positive way? way to that he said she said absolutely she was the only one who could understand his reactions his responses 
And then I said to her, come to church. She said, I will. I said, promise. She said, I promise. I never saw her again. <laughs> but she was a sweetheart. I was so impressed. She said, I'm not leaving. I'm staying right here until this is over. And so. He, he rejected her um, and, and the relationship with the son. Yeah. And, and he never her. He never her. Really? Yeah. And she took care of him to the yeah. end. Yeah. I didn't know that about that. I didn't know that. But ah, God is good. Absolutely, absolutely, positively the goodness of God. It's amazing. But I'm just encouraging you, don't let me have all the fun. You do it. <laughs> Learn some salvation scriptures and a version of the sinner's prayer and go do it. If you know somebody that's having some kind of trouble, trouble brings people to Christ. It really trouble brings them. I remember my <clears throat> my one niece, Carol's sister's daughter. She was the youngest one, and she was <clears throat> she got out of college, <clears throat> and she didn't know what she was going to do. And she was telling that to my to Carol and her mom. They were in the other room, and she was in, she was crying about it. <clears throat> and I heard that, and I thought, I'm going in. <laughs> I went and I said, listen to me, the reason you can't decide what to do and you're upset about this is because you're trying to decide with human wisdom. Proverbs chapter 8 talks about how God's wisdom is available to you in three places where the, where the paths meet along the way, along the way where the paths meet and at the gates of the city, three places where, the, where God's wisdom I said, you're trying to decide this on your own wisdom, which is flawed because it has as its goal whatever is best for you, not what God wants for you. And she took a deep breath and I could see change coming around in her. <laughs> this is so much fun. You got to do it. <laughs> you got to do it. She wasn't on her deathbed, but... So I explained to her about that, and I and I and I said you you can't. Uh, I said you can't have peace about your decision because you push God out of it. And I gave her some salvation scriptures, and I led her to the Lord. Her sister was already a believer, living out in Texas, and I said, now, now that you're a believer, you have to tell somebody. She called her sister up and told her how that. But her mother. And Carol and her, and Carol and her, and her grandmother were all sitting right there as an audience viewing that whole thing. Uh, it works all different kinds of ways, but you can tell when somebody is burdened and troubled, and usually that's when you go in. Hey, I want to hear what you guys are doing. I want to hear. I want to hear that you went in. I want to hear that you. You know, that somebody was in trouble and you went in and, and brought them to the Lord and then bring them in here. <laughs> I had a pastor that used to say, people don't come in church to get saved anymore. You get them saved and then bring them to church. That's what he said and uh, it's true. Would you stand? I've kept you too long talking about those experiences, but they're precious to me. But I want to hear experiences like that from you. I really do. I want to hear those. When you led somebody to the Lord, you would get addicted to that. <laughs> so, Father God, it's been awesome to have this attentive family listening. And your word goes forth with penetration. And we thank you, Lord, for that. And for every person in here, every believer in this place, Lord, we know they all have unbelievers in their families, unsaved loved ones and in their workplaces and in encounters with people here and there. And so I pray that, uh, that the Holy Spirit will always be with them and uh, leading and guiding and that victories will come. Asking that in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.